Hello again, and welcome to a financial thought leadership podcast, Banking on Experience, sponsored by CRM Next, the banking CRM, where we simplify work, drive growth, and deliver on experience. This podcast is meant to empower individuals working in the financial industry with stories, experiences, and knowledge straight from the source. Please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, and stay tuned for an awesome show. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining another episode of Banking on Experience. I'm your host, James Gilbert. Today, I am joined by Sandy Seafried, who is the CEO and president at Safe Harbor Financial. She's also the former CEO at Partner Colorado Credit Union. Welcome to the show, Sandy. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm particularly excited about this because it gets me kind of fired up. Um, We're going to be talking about implementing a culture that delivers. Why it just needs to be a little bit more than just talk before we do that. What is your perfect day outside of work? That would be something I would do on a Saturday, maybe do a little oil painting in the morning and then go up and hike for a couple hours and and then eat ice cream. (laughs) (laughs) What's your favorite ice cream? (laughs) What's your go-to ice cream? Dairy Queen blizzards. <laughs> what flavor? Come on, you got to give more detail than that. <laughs> okay, I order the same thing. They know me very well at this Dairy Queen. I order chocolate blizzard medium. At least I don't go to the large and uh, put cocoa fudge and peanut butter in it. It's my favorite. I've oh, yeah. Addiction to it right now. I didn't know you were an artist. Oil paintings. You're going to have to. Is that one behind you that you did? No, no, but that's one I'd like to do. I, but I, I definitely do a lot of oil painting. It, it, I, I had to give it up during the project because I just had absolutely no time and all my energy and talent and creativity went to the projects that I was involved in. But I'm going to hopefully get back to it soon. I can't say that I'm an artist in the sense like you probably, but I, I do love to paint and draw. For a long time, I was actually going to be an architect. Um, so I got very used to drawing buildings and drawing house plans out. I still sometimes just like will sit on a Sunday and my kids while they're coloring, I'll sit there and like draw just because I like it. <laughs> it's relaxing, is it not? Very much so. It takes all of your energy and it's difficult to put your mind any place else. So it's a real good stress reliever. Well, Sunday, let's talk about the topic now. Um, implementing a culture that delivers you know, we, we had talked about this and it was something that you're passionate about. So tell us why, first of all, you're passionate about this topic. Well, it was really interesting when I was very early in my 20s and I first started working for a credit union. I remember this supervisor in one of the branches complaining to me and she said straight out, you know, management doesn't care about us. They don't listen to us. We're just workers and no benefits, no nothing. And, and I couldn't understand the complaining thing because I just wasn't a big complainer. And I For some reason, I looked straight at her and I said, you know, someday when I'm president, I'm going to fix that. And I really didn't have those aspirations at that point in time. But I always felt, you know, if you don't like something, get in a position to fix it. And she just looked at me and she says, oh, when you get married and have babies, you won't have goals like that. Another wrong, right? Actually, the very first big project I took on when I became president of Partner Colorado Credit Union was to implement a culture. And you know, the attrition rate was in excess of 50% at that point in time. So there was a really good reason to do it as well. You know, you talked just briefly about some of the journey as you're becoming CEO, but let's talk, let's go a little bit deeper. Tell us the journey from when you worked your way up into the CEO position and what has been the difference between getting to that point? Well, I started like a lot of people and I actually started in the IT department. You know, you get to learn a lot about the credit union, knowing the IT and and actually implement it and training on it. And from there, I went to a training job. And from there, I went to branch manager. From there, I was a VP of marketing. And then I really wanted operations because I like to solve problems. And so I had to leave my first credit union after 11 years, and that happened to be in Germany. We were serving the military overseas, so I was there for 11 years when I came to Denver, and they just happened to have a VP of operations job open, and I just went over there, and it was just... It was just meant to be, and I took the job, and six years later, I applied for the CEO job, got my MBA in the interim, and was ready to roll. 
but it was never actually a goal. It just, you know, I worked on my resume, I learned everything I could, and I just kept striving to be the best at whatever position I was in. You know, for those that are striving to, you know, potentially one day reach that level, what advice would you give them? Learn more, do more. I was really good about taking on the projects nobody else wanted. Oh, start a loss prevention department. I'll do it. Start this. I'll do it. Implement a call center. I'll do it. You know, we, we were a hundred million dollar credit union at that point in time. So I was never afraid to take on something new that was meaningful for the organization and learn it from the bottom up and organize it. So I, I, I say, just learn everything you can and always be ready to take on more because it ultimately will build that resume and your career. I love that stretching outside of what you might be comfortable, I think is a really good way to put it. What have you learned from some of the failures that you've ran into? Because I mean, that's one of the things that we talked about prior to us getting on and, and recording was how important it is to learn from those failures and allow it, allow failures to happen. Yes, you have to be able to accept a failure now and then. And, and you know, being the perfectionist that I am, and it does drive me it's really difficult to face those failures, but you have to tear them apart and get introspective and really understand maybe what you did wrong and what you could do better next time and take that corrective action. I think the failures that I had were more political, which is why I run more on competencies and thank goodness the board I had, even though they would call me ornery from time to time, they still appreciated the fact that I was so competent and I was more on task and, and there were no politics in, inside the organization. So we really did away with the politics to make sure that those with competencies could grow in their position and know that they didn't have to you know, be the nicest person, have the most friends, you know, really, you know, we really promote it on competencies. And I think that staying away from the game playing, because when you stay away from game playing, that rises up and it ends up moving out of the organization because the rest of the team doesn't like to play games. I don't think I've ever heard it put like that. Give some examples of what you mean by games that are played. So I hired a VP once from the outside and it was a specialized position. And within a couple months, the colors start coming out. And at this point in time, the senior team was pretty solid and working together. Again, most of them were promoted from within and they're very competent. And the first thing I noticed was he would come to my office and he'd say, so-and-so VP, you know, she doesn't like you. And I'm like, well, I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to be respected. And, you know, I respect her and she does a good job and it doesn't really matter to me. And then he'd say something else about so-and-so just doesn't do a good job. And that's the start of the game right there, right? Make myself look good by making another VP look bad. And I knew at that point in time, I had problem on my hands and, and nobody else likes to play that game. So if they're doing it to the CEO, they're probably doing it to the other VPs and everybody starts shying away from that new VP and saying, this isn't how we play in our sandbox here. We are much more supportive and, you know, everybody has their own talent and their skill level. Let's just lead with what you do well. I love that because, you know, I think that too often leaders do get caught up in that, in that game. Way too much, actually. <laughs> Almost in every role that I've ever been in as a senior leader, I've ran into that. Like people doing the exact same thing. I'm a little bit more bold uh, on the bold side <laughs> uh, where I'm not afraid to speak my mind. And sometimes that's gotten me in trouble. But for the most part, you know, I think leaders respect it because I don't beat around the bush and I don't play the games like I think a lot of people do. But I think that there's still a culture that exists, especially in the business world, uh, that you have to play that game. And I think that it did before, but now it doesn't exist. And it's one of those things that were, those barriers are being broken down more and more every single day. I think so. We have in our culture brochure, we actually have a statement in there that says, you can say anything you want at Partner Colorado Credit Union. It's how you say it. You know, so just remember tomorrow, you have to maintain that relationship and work with that person. So just remember how you're going to say it isn't going to harm that relationship and moving the entity forward. The other thing is I never built 
the loyalty to me as the CEO. I always made sure that they knew my loyalty was to the credit union and to the board and to the members. And when you build a culture based upon loyalty to the organization, it is so much better than building it on, oh, got to like my boss, got to be loyal to my boss, because that doesn't endure the hard times. And there's always going to be difficult times in everybody's career. So what advice would you give people that, you know, aren't yet at a senior level leadership position where they can drive change like that? What advice would you give them to try to plant the seed into their leaders' minds as well? First of all, and I have a son who's in credit unions and he's, every time a job comes open, he's like, mom, I, I really want this job. And I'm like, well, say something, say something. Saying nothing is going to get you a no. So the first thing is to say something. Always let people know that you want to do more, that you want to go further, that you are willing to do what it takes. What's it going to take? And so that's the first thing I would say. The second thing is be relentless. <laughs> Always have the ideas. Don't be the complainer. Bring a problem to the table, but bring ideas and solutions to the table because that's what we're all looking for. We're all here to solve the problems for our members. So why not be the person who's always leading with the ideas? Because eventually you can be a go-to for that. And the third thing is really promote teamwork. You know, I'm not a big committee person where everything has to be done in committees, but involving people, making them feel part of the job, I think is really beneficial to the organization and to the leader. Love it. Have you ever seen the movie uh, Hook? It's got Robin Williams in it. Robin Williams plays Peter Pan. And uh, it's it's a basically like a, a real live version of Peter Pan, sort of. You got to watch it. It's great. One of the last boys on there, his name is Rufio. And he he when he whenever he's excited about things and thinks that things like really hit on point, he call he says bangerang. Um it's just like that's bangerang, like that's awesome. And that's what it reminded me of. Those three things are bangerang. I actually I want to get into something that that's not totally off topic here because I think that this also is a great example that you showed in your own career. And that's the book that you wrote. Let's talk about this book because at the highest level and even what you're doing right now, right? It was controversial when this happened. So can you talk to us about the story behind this book? By the way, if you're not familiar with it, this is all about cannabis and banking. And I think it's super important to hit on this. I think this is a really hot topic right now. And you have like this incredible journey that I want you to tell the audience about. It has been a lifetime journey. <laughs> Of the 20 years that I was CEO, I've been with the credit union 26 years, of the 20 years that I was CEO, seven years was spent on cannabis banking. So when we talk journey, we are talking a long journey here. But the book, that's one of those little duties assigned that not specified in the job description, as I told my board, you didn't tell me I was going to have to public speak and you didn't have, you didn't tell me I was going to have to write a book for you. I, I you know, these are things that I didn't expect and didn't foresee in my future, but I am an introvert by nature, like painting alone, hiking alone, that type of thing. I like my alone time, it gives me lots of think time and, and I'm truly, um, a uh, high level uh, introvert. So I was starting to get all these calls in 2016 about what are you doing and how are you doing it? And, you know, what is cannabis banking all about? And, and I'm not one big on the phone. I like to be at my desk. I like to work. I'm developing the program. I'm onboarding the clients. I'm learning the industry and you're interrupting all that good stuff I'm doing, right? Need my nose to the grindstone. And so I was complaining <laughs> Uh, okay, maybe I do complain a little. Here. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I was complaining to my PR uh, firm. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with all these calls that are starting to come in? And she's like, well, if you don't want to answer the question 20 times, take all the questions they're asking you and put it in a book. Give them something to read that will, you know, get the initial conversation out of the way and then lead to just deeper conversations of those who are really interested. So it's exactly what I did. I took all of the questions and just kind of outlined it, put some things in there about just the journey that we took to get there. And then when people would call me, I'd say, you know, let me give you a book or let me send you a book or buy the book. And, and when you finish that book, we'll be able to have a deeper conversation about cannabis banking, but more importantly, 
you will see whether or not you have the stomach to do what we're doing. And it was still in the very early stages. What people didn't realize at that point in time is the amount of pressure that was on financial institutions in 2015, 2016 to get that job done, like enduring 15 exams inside of five years. Not many senior teams could do that, but I think the culture that we created really, really assisted in getting that job done and keeping us in the game. So what do you think the learnings from doing the book specifically had when it came to culture? Because you ran into a controversial topic that you had to convince people of, right? So talk to us a little bit about that and how it played a role into culture. The moral judgment. Now we're going back to 2015 here. And when we involve ourselves in a project, we, we go deep, you know, we don't want to fail. And, you know, the fear of failure is a driving force in and of itself. And, and, you know, people were saying, oh, she's going to get prosecuted. She's going to go to jail. You know, she doesn't know what she's doing. Well, you know, I was, I was afraid of all that stuff too. So it just made me dig in deeper in, in, you know, the, the culture and the team behind me, you know, and I made one mistake in the very early stages and I tried to keep it very quiet from staff because the fewer people I involved, I felt was a lower risk for them on a personal level and more risk for me. And I was willing to take that risk in my career. But that was probably a mistake in hindsight because they were used to having a trusting relationship with management. And here I was keeping things quiet from them. And, you know, in hindsight, I think I would have done that differently now if I were to go back. But the culture was such that it was solid and running in the right order. And the fact that the CEO kind of went dark and into this project for a period of, I would say, five years they were able to hold that organization together and run it and trust that we were going in the right direction. And we take really good care of our employees. So if there's a win in the organization, everybody realizes a win. And, and the more wins they started seeing, the more they started appreciating what we were doing. And the more people that came into the credit union said, well, thank you. What you're doing for the community is great and keeping us safer. You know, we started getting the positive feedback or even some people coming in and saying, you know, because you're doing something for the community, because you're banking cannabis businesses, I want to open my account here because you're very innovative. So, you know, the culture got reinforced by what we did. And, and, and I have to say that I think the staff today is very proud of what we've done and how we were able to get through all of that and manage a project to the size that it's gotten to this day. Well, it's amazing to me how, you know, in that story, what's so just in your face is like culture truly does translate when you do it well into growth. And this story that you just gave is the perfect explanation of this is how I, you know, you had people that were coming up to you and wanting to, wanting to bank at your organization simply from the fact that you've done this. And we don't hear enough of those type of stories, you know, where like actually focusing on something that culturally is impacting the experience that members are going to have and customers are going to have. It's just one of those things where too often we hear about, oh, you got to focus on culture, but we don't hear the end results and the outcome of the success stories of somebody who's actually done it and been successful and it's actually helped grow their organization. So kudos to you for that because I think that's amazing. I have one last question for you, but before I do that, I want to do a quick recap. The three things you mentioned, don't be afraid to speak up, watch your tone and how you say it. Also, don't be afraid to do teamwork because that's what you ultimately should be going and doing as a team. And then the other thing that I want to I just highlight as a fourth point with your story um, in creating this book is educate yourself in areas that you're not afraid to dive into. Because I think if you boil down, I think leadership in general, one of the best leaders, well, some of the best leaders that I've ever known and I've ever met, try to educate themselves uh, cross functions and try to understand, you know, the pain of, of other leaders in the organization as much as possible, which is totally outside of their scope, right, of work. And I think some of the best leaders do that. They educate themselves in areas that most people wouldn't think that they need to focus on. So I want to highlight that because I think that you showed that in this journey. Everyone was telling you no, and you're like, well, I'm going to educate myself more. 
And, you know, lack of a better way of putting it, I'm going to prove them wrong, right? And sometimes I think that you sometimes have to have that type of mentality where if you believe in an idea and you're passionate about it, just educate yourself enough to be able to speak to it and tell the story so that you can get people on board. And I think that's a leadership trait that oftentimes doesn't get um, highlighted as something that people should focus on and because you get shied away from it. Well, does it align to the vision? Does it align to the mission? Well, what if this helps develop your mission? I have to say the one big lesson I've learned is that opportunity exists where other people don't want to go or what other people don't want to do. I look back and I say, nobody wanted to do it. Yes, there was a risk cover all your bases, do your research, do your homework, and opportunity availed. You put it a lot better than I did. (laughs) That's why you're a pro, right? Well, Sunny, we're at time. I would love for the audience to know how they can reach you and talk to you about this more, especially about this topic and about your book. Okay, so you can reach me now. I'm at um, Safe Harbor Financial, so shfinancial.org. So it's just Sunday at shfinancial.org. Um, so you can go to that website online and do an inquiry and get to me one way or another. And the book is available on Amazon or on the website as well, a PDF version. So happy to answer questions on that as well. You got to give the audience the title of the book. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. Cool. Yeah, it's Navigating Safe Harbor, Cannabis Banking in Uncertain Times, which in 2015, it was definitely uncertain. <laughs> Navigating Safe Harbor. Yeah, I, I, I like that title, actually, in hindsight. <laughs> yeah, I think you did a good job. Sunday, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. We appreciate it. Loved your thoughts today and can't wait to talk to you more about, about things that are going on and see how everything's continuing to grow. 